Hello, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon, wherever in the world you are. You're at the webinar, Game Changing Financial Models to Unlock Investments in Clean Cooling. Um, I'm David. I'm a Carbon Impact Specialist at Responsibility. And I have here with me Thomas, which is a Sustainable Energy Finance Specialist at BASE, and Satish, which is a Senior Energy Specialist at Responsibility. We're still waiting some people to join, so I will use this time uh, to say a few words before we begin. This webinar is hosted by Responsibility, which is an impact asset manager with more than 16 years of on-the-ground experience in emerging and developing countries. Responsibility manages the Global Climate Partnership Fund, which is also a host, uh, host, sorry, and this is also hosted by the Basel Agency for Sustainable Energy, which we will also introduce shortly. Um, I think now, I think you can see my screen. A little bit of the housekeeping, also to give some more minutes to, for people to join. On the right side of the screen, you will have the control panel. And if you look there, you will have a section called handouts. There you can access the presentation that we'll show today. And also everyone uh, is mute, with the exception of the presenters. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat in, in the control panel also. Uh, we will answer the questions immediately or just at the end during the Q&A session. Mm -hmm. um, let's wait for a couple of minutes and then I, I will hand over to Thomas to start the webinar. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to our presenters now. Please, Thomas, go ahead. Great, so I think you can hear me. This uh, webinar. Um, maybe a, perhaps a quick intro of uh, the Basel Agency for Sustainable Energy, which is uh, a not-for-profit organization and a specialist partner of United Nations Environment, founded in 2001. So we design, develop, and implement innovative business models, financing, financial structures, and risk mitigation mechanisms to unlock both public and private, as well as different agencies in structuring, including to trigger investments. So we work, we work around the globe with a focus on developing countries and across all sectors, from hard to reach segments to SMEs and also commercial projects. We normally work very closely with the providers and local banks to build synergies and to coordinate efforts. So in a nutshell, we, we are aware that there is a lot of fund of demand for this funding. Uh, hi, Dimitris, thanks for your question. The, we have some reports that the audio is not good from your side. 
I don't know if it's in general or only from Thomas' side. Uh, could you know, please, the audio uh, is not not clear. Yeah, it's, there are some disruptions in the audio. From from everyone or just from Thomas' side? From Thomas, from Thomas' side. Yeah, maybe if you want. Can you see? Um, okay, does this work better? So yes. Yes. Great. Okay, thank you. So I, I gave a quick intro of, of BASE um, and what we're doing, and I wanted to add that in addition to creating these mechanisms, financing mechanisms, in the last three years we have been focusing increasingly on cooling through different partnerships with the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Group. Um, so thank you. I'll give over to, to David. Thank you, and uh, I was saying before, this webinar is also hosted by GCPF, the Global Climate Partnership Fund. It's an innovative public-private partnership that uses public funding to leverage private capital for uh, climate change mitigation. Uh, we do it by providing debt to financial institutions in emerging economies to finance energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. Up to now, we have uh, 35 partner institutions in more or less 25 countries. And with more than 700 million US dollars of invested capital, we have contributed to the reduction of uh, 17 million tons of CO2 from these projects. And this is more or less the annual emissions of a country like Mongolia. As we will discuss later, GCPF has a technical assistance facility that have supported the implementation of um, close to 200 projects in the last years. But why are we talking about cooling today? Um, in a warming world, everyone wants to look for solutions for cooling. Uh, for an example, uh, IEA mentions that a new residential AC is sold every 30 seconds. And as you can see on the slide, the total market potential for cooling applications is estimated in $7 trillion for the next 30 years. Cooling also has also a relevant impact on climate change. The space cooling represents 10% of the global electricity consumption and the energy demand for space cooling uh, is expected to increase by three times by around 2050, and it will consume as much electricity as China and India today. Another relevant topic when we talk about cooling is the use of refrigerant gases. Since the signing of the Montreal Protocol, the impact of these gas gases in the ozone layer has been the, um, declining. However, the refrigerant gases normally have a thousand times more uh, global warming potential if you compare it to CO2. Um, then now uh, we will discuss with Thomas the opportunities and uh, on how to do it more efficient, do cooling more efficient, and this is what Thomas will explain in the next slide. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you, David. So the numbers that were just um, shown really express that cooling has an important impact on climate change. But these 6.9 trillion US dollar that will go into cooling um, can also be seen as an opportunity to try to challenge, uh, to channel a large portion of these investments into clean and efficient cooling. But um, despite the clear economic benefits of energy efficiency, um, these investments in energy efficient technology are not happening at a pace expected, and there are a couple of barriers um, that inhibit these. So, as most of you are well aware of, um, although energy efficient technology has a lower cost of ownership with actual, actually much lower energy consumption and lower maintenance costs, it's also much more expensive upfront, or at least slightly expensive upfront, and investment decision is very often highly sensitive to the purchase price. And this is the first key barrier. Um, in addition, uh, through our work, we have identified that lack of trust in the equipment performance is another very important barrier. So, um, basically, uh, whether these promised savings will actually be achieved is very often not believed in by, by uh, clients. And finally, um, enterprises normally prefer to invest in their core business. So, we can imagine, let's say, let's take a hotel, for instance, who has a choice between investing in a new lobby or investing in a cool a new efficient system, it's normally not the cooling system that is prioritized. So luckily there are some solutions. Um, there are innovative finan financial mechanisms that enable to overcome these barriers and it depends on the sector we're working in. So a couple of examples listed here are um, mechanisms we are actually currently working on in different countries. 
on-bill financing enables people to, for instance, purchase uh, efficient equipment through the utility bill on wage through directly through the wage. Um, Remittance-based uh, mechanisms enable people to family members who live abroad to pay and enable access to sustainable energy to their family members remaining in the country. And this is morely, mostly for the residential sector. On the commercial sector, there are other models. Most of you probably know the shared and guaranteed savings ESCO models, but there are other ones, uh, energy savings insurance, in which an insurance compensates the client for uh, when the savings are not uh, actually achieved. And another very interesting one, servitization model. And my aim here is not to go into all of these or to give an overview. You can actually have a look at this uh, report on the left. You can even click on that, um, which gives an overview. But my, given the time we have, the idea here is to focus on one of them, a particularly innovative one, which is servitization. And um, for cooling, this is called cooling as a service. So um, servitization is a trend that is really across all industries. So in the already in the 50s, 60s, in the copy copy industry, Xerox, for instance, had started to shift from selling copy machines to selling copies to the users. And other industries now have replicated this. So Rolls-Royce also, since many years, have been implementing, um, instead of selling the engines, they sell power by the hour. The solar industry has been also revolutionized by, instead of selling solar panels, selling energy delivered by the solar systems, enabling commercial entities to basically access to the technology without ever needing to purchase the asset. And this is now moving into other sectors, for instance, cars um, and lighting. So we have uh, Volvo, for instance, opening now subscription um, models, and we have the airport in Amsterdam, which instead of buying the fixtures and buying the lighting, actually purchases lighting by the hour from Philips Lighting. And on the left, you can see that cooling is still quite in the early phase of this adoption curve. And what we uh, really believe and see happening is that this is going to change very quickly and the cooling sector is going to change and moving also towards uh, the as a service model. Um, so we presented this model to the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance last year, who endorsed this as one of the most innovative climate finance instruments. And the way it works is quite simple. Customers basically do not own the equipment and simply buy the service delivered by the equipment. Technology providers own the equipment and offer uh, also the maintenance and cover the operating costs. So for the client, it really becomes uh, an operating expense instead of being an, an investment cost. And an interesting element from the cooling as a service model is that it really aligns incentives. So since the provider is covering the maintenance and the operation, there's a huge incentive to actually install the most efficient system and maintain it correctly so that the operating costs are minimized because the, the, this, the income comes from selling the service, which is a fixed cost per unit, independently of how much the system actually um, costs to operate. So uh, the, this model really makes the lower life cycle cost tangible because providers decide which system to install, and they base the decision on this life cycle cost. Um, and we'll see later some, some capital, capitalization structures. So the key actors involved are clients, technology providers, and banks. And we'll click, quickly go now into some of the advantages for each of them. So for customers, um, just one before. For customers, uh, of course, there's no capital expenditure. Uh, the contract is structured in such a way that it's off balance sheet. So that means uh, there's no on balance sheet liability. It's different, very different than the lease. And this is important to, to clarify. There is no performance risk because the customer is purchasing the outcome, which is the cooling. So whatever happens in between to deliver that cooling is responsibility of the provider. Uh, so it essentially is a way to totally outsource the cooling service and the customer can then focus on, on its core business. For technology providers, it's, um, there's a couple of benefits. First, uh, it really enables to fully deploy the potential of the technology. Very often it might be optimized or operated in a certain way that really the technology is used that is, that is best. And this can only be done if the provider is actually the one operating. It's much more powerful than just giving instructions to the client. And um, it also enables predictable and continuous revenue streams instead of depending on, on sales. The profits can also be higher because the outcome is sold, which brings more value to customers instead of selling parts and equipment. 
and um, it increases the demand for energy efficient solutions and also is really an important differentiation from the competition who might still be with business as, as usual. For uh, investors and financial institutions, CAS or cooling as a service is really an opportunity to place green funding. Uh, cooling are typically large projects with a lot of energy efficiency gains. Um, and this model will increase the demand for green funding because providers can expand their pool of clients interested in these technologies. Also, um, servitization in general is something that is also applicable to other industries, so not only cooling. So it's really beneficial to start looking into how to finance these servitization models, which will become uh, the, new, the new business as usual in the future. Um, Another advantage is that it enables providers to uh, investors to invest in um, assets actually generating cash flows. There are also some challenges. Um, it is not easy to do this transition, and otherwise it would already have been done earlier. And uh, it, it requires two main things: a couple of changes internally in the way these businesses work, and really a mind shift on, on what the what the aim is. Uh, the changes are really related to the internal procedures. The culture, the strategy. So for example, success measurement is normally done with by measuring sales, number of sales, and there are also incentives established to actually uh, increase or maximize the number of sales. And this must be adapted to also uh, enable to compensate or to, to measure uh, additional service contract signed, which cannot be considered as a sale. Uh, and it's also different than lease, because a lease would be considered a sale. In the case of certification, it would not be. So this needs to be adapted internally. And there are new risks that need to be considered linked to the performance uh, of the equipment, which normally the providers can assess quite well because it's their own technology, and also linked to the payment risk of the client. So these must be addressed. And the mind shift is related to really challenging the business as usual, focusing a lot on the customer because servitization also enables to offer a service directly to the customer and to be highly, uh, so it requires uh, to be highly customer centric and really tailor the service to what the customer wants. And of course, for many companies, it means they need to be more patient for the return on investment, um, which normally they're not used to because they sell, the, they sell their equipment and then they, they basically um, can move, move ahead. So uh, this, uh, how it works, so we looked until now at how it works between the technology provider and the client, and that's important, this contract. But this uh, section is more on how the financing structure could work, and there are many options, and this is just two of them that we're, we're highlighting. The first one is what we call sale and lease back. So it's a form of asset backed financing in which technology providers sign contracts with clients, with one or two or more clients, and then sells the asset to an investor or a bank um, who leases this equipment back to the provider. So there is an injection of capital that the provider can use to sign more contracts, and there are monthly payments made to the bank to continue using the equipment and offering the service to the client. Um, it's interesting for the bank for a couple of reasons. First, uh, the ownership, uh, well, the, the asset is the first collateral. Of course, it's not a very liquid collateral, but there are other collaterals. The other one is the actual contract between the client and the provider. So if the provider somehow doesn't pay the leasing fee to the bank, then the client will pay directly to the bank. So it will be structured as a, a trust, basically, which would pay to the bank if the provider doesn't pay. Uh, and if there are any guarantees in place, you can see the bottom guarantee provider, then um, which would basically protect the provider from a payment default from his client, and this can also be endorsed to the bank. The second option is more classical. It's project finance. It's basically setting up a special purpose vehicle in which investors can inject capital. And this SPV would be purchasing the equipment from the technology provider and would be signing an agreement with the contracts with the clients directly and signing a separate agreement with the providers who will be offering service or pooling as a service to the, to the clients. Um, and then in this case, the guarantee, if, if existent, would be applicable to the SPP directly. This is more typical, so more people know this. This is a, a more normal, let's say, approach, but the other one is also extremely interesting. I'll give it over to, to Satish. Um, he will give uh, talk about a, a case study, not about uh, cooling as well specifically, uh, but slightly different. And Satish will also explain the, basically the difference with CAS and, and how that model could evolve into CAS. Sure. Thank you, David. Thank you, Thomas.
for this interesting presentation. So uh, it's great to see um, this innovative financing models are being evolved uh, to address this efficient cooling demand. Um, but uh, while it is interesting, so um, if you have to deploy it globally, each country adopts their own approach in deploying. So uh, before we uh, take this solution uh, to the ground to the people, we also need to understand what is currently happening and how cooling services are being delivered currently and what are the challenges and how this solution cooling as a service solution could be potentially address those gaps. So we thought we'll take you through uh, one of the case example of Sri Lanka, how uh, cooling solutions are being delivered in the country based on our experience uh, interacting with a few of these ESCO companies and with our partner banks. So uh, why cooling is uh, important for Sri Lanka? Because it's a hot and humid climatic zone and uh, tourism and hospital industry is growing at a faster pace and cooling contributes to more than 60% of energy cost of these businesses. So uh, normally we look at uh, tourism industry as a local business, but if you look at a broader angle, tourism is actually an export business for uh, the country because that brings in a lot of foreign currency into the country. And it is important for these businesses to maintain the cost competitiveness by optimizing the cost of operations to attract global tourists. And also the recent events uh, which happened in the country like uh, the terror attack in April and then the recent coronavirus outbreak. So all these uh, recent events are also pushing this segment to look at these efficient solutions because they have to sustain their operation even at a lower uh, occupancy rate. And while we see there is a huge demand for these uh, solutions, but uh, not many players are active in the market. So this is mainly due to various challenges, uh, but we we came across um, uh, we came across an institution um, in Sri Lanka, uh, which is which is called Lanka Energy Conservation. Their brand name is Eco33, and they are one of the few players in the market who are still actively pursuing this uh, cooling solutions, delivering to a large uh, commercial hotels, hospitals, and then uh, large commercial buildings. So they are Australian-backed um, energy service company. They're very active in Sri Lanka for the last few, four or five years, and uh, they have a good track record developed over the period. So how they work? So they work with technology providers, and uh, they procure those technologies, and they reach out to the building owners for delivering energy efficient cooling solutions and their USP is guaranteed savings. While the building owners uh, or appreciate the fact they're getting a co efficient cooling solution, but they're always uh, hesitant to, to move forward because uh, there is always uh, uncertainty in the savings estimates. And uh, normally the traditional ESCO companies, they provide a performance guarantee, which is which was the traditional way, but still the building owners are not convinced with the performance guarantee given by the ESCO company itself. So what they did was they reached out to a local commercial bank and then they paid a guarantee fee and then they provided a guarantee uh, for this backing backing the guarantee for their uh, savings. So this helped the building owner uh, to get a comfortness on this solution and then uh, they reached out to a, another local commercial bank where they have a, a good relationship and they use this bank guarantee as a uh, 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 backup and they reached out to the commercial bank for getting a term loan and using this term loan they paid the technology upfront cost and uh, the ESCO company along with the technology provider they provide the OEM for the client and the client pay the annual OEM fee and they pay the interest rate uh, interest payment to the local commercial bank. So this is the structure which is being uh, deployed by this company which is again seen a lot of uptake in the market uh, While well, there are a lot of challenges, we'll discuss in the few later slides, but uh, this has seen a good uptake in the market. So let's see how this structure has been deployed in uh, the specific cases. So this is uh, um, this is uh, the same structure they adopted for a hotel uh, project uh, in Sri Lanka. So when they approached the hotel uh, with this energy efficient cooling solution along with the bank guarantee, so the hotel was first they were convinced because they were get their cost of operation is getting optimized and uh, also the interesting part for them is they use this bank guarantee 
to reach out to the local commercial bank and they negotiated the interest payment with the local commercial bank so this bank guarantee from this esco company helped the hotel to negotiate better terms for the uh, term loan and that helped to uh, implement this project so the investment was around four and fifty thousand dollars and the guaranteed payback was three years and three months so the actual payback is still uh, they are working on so it will be quite less than the three years so the next one which is again interesting um, for a financial institution because normally it's not for the financial institution the opportunity is not only to lend to these kind of type of projects it is also the financial institutions can look at optimizing their own cost of operation so in this example the Ceylon bank which is uh, one of the uh, large commercial banks in the country so they partnered with this company to implement this energy efficient uh, cooling solutions so initially there were a lot of skepticism on the savings estimates but uh, when they implemented so the initial guaranteed uh, payback was three years but uh, when they started releasing the savings they were able to get the payback uh, in one year and nine months which is less than two years so this gave a confidence to this financial institution so now they've decided that after seeing this uh, impact positive impact of this solution they will now take the solution to their larger client base and they will try to promote this efficient cooling to their clients so while this is uh, interesting um, to see there is a good uptake for this model but uh, for this institution to reach this level they had to build their credentials for a few years with uh, with their own capital requirements so for other esco companies it might be a challenge and also reaching out to the local bank, commercial banks getting a bank guarantee was also challenging for this company because uh, initially they had to deposit 100% of the guarantee amount in their account to get a guarantee bank guarantee for their projects so over the year they build the credentials and through that they negotiate with the local commercial bank and then they agreed on a better uh, structure for their bank guarantee so now they pay only 20% of the deposit uh, for availing 100% of guarantee. So with this, they were able to scale up to a larger market uh, uh, potential and they were able to build good credentials over the year. But again, with this structure, while the market opportunity is big, it's it's again a challenge to scale up to the full market potential because every time you have to reach to your local commercial bank for a bank guarantee and you have to deposit uh, some amount and then your capital gets logged in, in for these guarantees. So there is always be a scalability issue uh, with this structure. So there needs to be definitely an innovative business model to meet this uh, demand for efficient cooling requirements. So we see cooling as a service could potentially address this gap in terms of scalability where uh, these uh, players can start raising capital on their books and then they can start providing service to their, to their clients and that could potentially address the scalability issues. And uh, the local commercial banks and NBFCs have to play a major role because they have to look at beyond their traditional way of looking at things and uh, then with their support, with the active participation of the local players, uh, this uh, demand for efficient cooling systems can be addressed. So thank you. So uh, I will now hand it over to my colleagues. Thank you, Satish. Um, okay. Um, now that we have discussed a little, uh, little bit about different business models for cooling, then how can we at GCPA Fanbase help you support your project? Um, for those of you who are already partners with GCPF, this will be familiar. This is our eligibility criteria for projects and energy efficiency. So the first one is uh, we need to ensure a reduction of energy or CO2 emissions of at least 20%. Uh, for it, our conversations with Thomas before, uh, this is quite easy. And in this case, the calculations and the reporting is provided by the service provider of the cooling. Um, second, that 75% of the of, of the loan amount that the banks give to the service provider should be invested in the energy efficiency measure itself, and 25 can be used for support activities. And this is normally assessed during the credit assessment process. And finally, all the investments have to comply with our environmental and safety um, guidelines, but this is uh, normally provided through the financial institution in their ENS uh, assessment and project risk categorization. Of course, as I mentioned before, GCPF has a technical assistance facility that uh, can support you along all this process. 
and Thomas, can you? Um, and there are some questions about this. Can you give us some more information about the CAS Alliance when, from your side? Thank you, um, David. So about the CAS initiative in general. So we at base are uh, partner with the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program (KSEP), which is a philanthropy um, based in California, uh, working under Climate Works to stimulate the market to adopt the cooling as a service model. And this initiative includes a couple of components. The, the first one, uh, tools. So we have been developing tools to enable the model. So these include, for instance, the development of cooling as a service contracts, uh, pricing models. How do you price such a new service uh, per, per ton of duration or per unit of cold air, um, as well as financial structures, such as the one we presented before, but also other ones. Um, with these tools, we have been supporting demonstration projects and we are supporting further pilot projects in different countries, uh, including in the Caribbean, so Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Grenada, as well as in, in Mexico, Costa Rica, Argentina, Nigeria, South Africa, and India. And there we are really working with technology providers and investors to, to facilitate the implementation of, of the model. Uh, another component on the top, you can see the alliance, the cooling and service alliance. Uh, we have been creating partnerships with technology providers and clients and investors and associations and networks to uh, to really uh, basically build some capacity, share the knowledge, and, and create a, a coalition uh, to to facilitate the implementation of the model. And uh, finally, awareness raising. So we have been uh, presenting this at different conferences. We have been organizing workshops. We are now starting to org organize what we call matchmaking events. So the first one is happening on Monday next week in Cape Town, South Africa, in which we will bring together technology providers, investors, and clients and present the model in more detail and have them basically meeting each other with the aim to, to get into, well, to enter into cooling and service deals. Um, and uh, of course, webinars, articles, podcasts, etc. So um, there's more on the website and uh, happy to, to give more information. Uh, so yeah, you can also join the Alliance, of course. It's open for anyone to join. You can, uh, on the website, there's a way to do it or you can just write me an email. Uh, normally it's a very simple, uh, very, very simple uh, process and you can join the, <laughs> the Alliance. And you can also uh, register to the newsletter that we have. So we are very active. We have been very active last year and we're, this year is going to be even crazier. <laughs> so you can uh, register to that if you want some updates. So thank you, Thomas and Satish. Uh, you have our contacts there and the link to the CAS Initiative website and the GCPF website too. Uh, this was all from our side. We have received a couple of questions during the webinar. Uh, so I will probably pass a two of them to Thomas. The first one is if um, you're making alliance also in the USA. So, Thomas. So this Cooling as a Service Alliance is global. Um, anyone is welcome to join. And in fact, we have uh, in this alliance, for instance, global manufacturers, of which some are based in the United States, um, some are based in other countries. So we have, for instance, Daikin, Train, Johnson Controls, Danfoss on board of this alliance. Uh, and we have also local contractors. So yes, it is open to anyone uh, in any country, including in the US. Uh, our the focus or the focus of our support of implementation, of pro uh, project implementation is on uh, Latin America, Asia and Africa, because uh, this is also the focus of uh, our, donors, our donors. So we would not be supporting the implementation of a project in the US, but we of course will be sharing the toolkit that we are developing, and this would be available to anyone who would like to, to access these tools or the contracts, etc. Uh, to uh, to replicate basically in, in the US uh, with, without our direct support. The second question, David? There's one question also about um, preventive maintenance in HVAC systems. So whether preventive maintenance is relevant in HVAC systems? Yes, so this is a, a, an important and a very good question because in fact, uh, if preventive maintenance is done correctly in these systems, then corrective maintenance will be much, much lower and systems can be used for a much longer time. But of course, when uh, clients purchase a system, 
they will not have uh, this normally this knowledge and they will normally avoid doing maintenance unless it's necessary so normally there's more corrective main expensive corrective maintenance done rather than preventive maintenance while if the company which actually sells and offers the services is the one delivering and owning the system and there's a direct incentive to actually optimize this and make sure that preventive ma uh, maintenance is is done carefully and also um, predicted in a very very uh, let's say smart manner using ai and different technologies to make sure uh, and data which are all new tools that can be used to minimize the costs over the long term so CAS really enables this and in addition maybe i take advantage to add uh, to add this also in the cooling as a service model there is also the option to add uh, add-ons to the system so for example um, if the provider is offering cooling per ton of refrigeration and it might be cheaper to let's say purchase electricity overnight rather than during the day so in the long run it might be worth let's say installing a thermal storage system on the on the roof or something or in the in the basement uh, the provider would be allowed to do so because this will reduce its cost to, to deliver the service and the client doesn't need to invest either so it gives some flexibility also to the provider to really install the whole uh, whole well, to have the whole system view and not just actual equipment delivering the cooling. Um, so it's uh, really the freedom that the provider has to then optimize and minimize the costs to operate the system and offer the, the best service to the client. Thanks, Thomas. There is another question maybe for uh, both of you, Satish and Thomas. Um, one person is asking about the, the size of the, also the residential market and compared to the industrial and commercial side. Um, and also what are the mechanisms for the residential part? So maybe Satish can give us some input from based on his experience and, and uh, Thomas also mentioned some, some models from the um, residential side. Satish, you want to add something on this one? Yeah, sure. So I think relatively the size of the residential market is also huge, in especially in the Asian context. And while uh, currently the main driver for this uh, deployment of residential cooling is the cost, in some countries, the electricity tariffs drive the uh, deployment of this cooling. Um, but in some countries, it's quite challenging um, to deploy. And also, the availability of standards and labeling mechanism also helps customers or clients to choose the efficient appliances uh, for their residential purposes. So how uh, financial institutions are actually playing is uh, they are also now uh, a lot of innovative uh, financing mechanisms coming up they partner with the retail retail big retailers in the markets and then uh, they try to promote this uh, energy efficient appliances through whitelist uh, developed uh, by these uh, funding institutions i think that way they were able to reach out to a broader uh, uh, group of people so we're seeing good quite a good success in india in vietnam uh, and also some part in indonesia uh, like the markets, other markets like Cambodia or in Sri Lanka. So it's still uh, the long way to go for the residential sector. Thomas, you want to add? Yeah. Sure. So maybe I can just add a reference to a report, uh, the future of cooling from the IEA, which gives great numbers to answer to the, the question also on the capacity of residential versus commercial. And in fact, uh, approximately half um, of the installed capacity of air conditioning worldwide is from the commercial and half is about the residential, actually probably more 55 residential and 45 commercial. So that's to answer to that question. And there are, uh, yes, different models to address the residential sector. We are currently implementing different models specifically on cooling for the residential sector in Ghana, in Senegal and in Rwanda. Um, in Senegal and Rwanda, we are implementing what we call the on-bill financing mechanism, which enables, for example, households to replace their fridge. Um, and let's assume today they pay $100 per year on, on electricity to drive that fridge. And with the new fridge, they would pay only 50. So the difference would basically be, um, they would actually continue to pay this 100 for a couple of years. And with the difference, uh, they would be paying the credit for that fridge. So they basically get a new fridge for free, paid by the savings directly to the utility bill. And this really reduces the payment default for the banks um, because normally people really don't want to get their uh, electricity cut because they're not paying the bill. So normally it's, it's quite an effective manner to reach these types of customers. 
Um, in, in Ghana, uh, the on-wage financing mechanism is another mechanism that we are implementing because it's, um, the situation is slightly more complex with the utilities. It's also not always very easy to, to, have, to bring utilities on board. Um, in the case of, of Ghana, so the, another approach was used in which the, the financing for the energy efficiency upgrades were made directly through the, the wage, through the salary and deducted, which also reduced significantly the default risk uh, of these customers. Um, and uh, another one I mentioned earlier was remittance. That's mostly focused. I mean, we when we have implement, implemented it, it was mostly focused on, on solar home systems. Uh, but this is also a model that is really interesting for the residential sector. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are a couple of ideas. Uh, leasing, well, as a service, could be implemented, but it is a bit more complex because you there are quite some costs associated with delivering that service. And uh, for such small transactions, it, it, it means you need to have a high density of, of customers. Um, but leasing or pay as you go with, with different uh, apps and, and new technologies could also be implemented. In fact, we're looking into this as well. Um, I think there were some other questions, David. The first one is the fact that none of the winners in our incubator uh, program came from the on-grid refrigeration sector. And to what extent we will be attacking that area? Uh, great question, and in fact, um, we are not only working with these five companies in the incubator, these are the ones that were basically selected this year, but we have started already to work in um, in India and South Africa and in Mexico with different players, and in, in South Africa we are, are working with a company called Sphere Solutions, and they offer on-grid refrigeration, uh, for instance, for the retail sector and also the industrial and different other uh, types of customers. And with them, we are a little bit more ahead than the incubator um, uh, providers who, with whom we're really starting now. And with them, we are already quite close to to signing or to getting the first project uh, rolling. And so it is very much uh, applicable for, for that sector, especially because the consumption is normally continuous over the whole year. So it works very well and it could even include the cabinets, so the place where the food is actually stored. So you deliver a full service to the client and not just the chilled air. There's some um, other questions here. Most of the countries have building energy conservation codes. So how are cooling action plans being incorporated there? Um, um, maybe David can take that. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. And you mentioned you're also working at, um, or part of the UN environment, and we work closely also with uh, United for Efficiency. Actually, the, they give support to policymakers in different countries to implement best practice, uh, well, both from industrial and commercial side and also from residential side, uh, setting minimum energy standards, uh, performance standards, or minimum con consumption values for uh, efficient equipment. So this is uh, the, in the way we, through them, and try to raise awareness among policymakers. There is um, it's the best way because the UN has a very broad reach and, and can reach them. And there is a question also for, uh, maybe Satish can help us on this one. Uh, actually, the person who's asking that, I don't know if they're from a financial institution or from the service provider side, but they're asking about the conditions of the contract after qualifying for capital by GCPF. Sure, sure. Um, so GCPF uh, is a debt uh, fund. Uh, so we predominantly uh, deploy this fund uh, through financial institutions that's indirect financing. And we also have a small uh, direct financing um, uh, vehicle, but that is mainly focused on medium to large scale uh, solar C and I players. So through financial institutions, so the main conditions if a partner institution partner with us, so they have to deploy this, our fund, towards uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy projects which has impact of minimum 20% CO2. So whatever the projects which qualify for this 20% CO2 impact, so they the institutions can uh, report back to us and they can qualify for the funding. So in this case of cooling, so um, so I, we discussed on few examples in Sri Lanka. So if the hotel industry is carrying out uh, this cooling service model. So they would have defined a baseline for the cooling service and then they would have also quantified the impact, how much this efficient cooling system is going to bring in. So if that meets the 20% energy saving criteria, then that qualifies for GCPF. 
and on on the previous comment on the building code so like to add uh, here so though the building codes are there but uh, the deployment of building codes is is a challenge so the enforcement of building codes in most of the countries is still not uh, complete so 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 the investments in the energy efficiency is still driven by a business motive than from a regulatory push or building codes push thank you satish um thanks also for the opportunity to share this through some other platforms and and for future webinars that we have uh, there is one question about the interest rate for uh cas projects and i think satish can also complement here but they think this is based on the uh, specific conditions of the financial institution and and it varies on among countries and depending on the currency so i think it's a very specific question on the on the specific country you're based on so maybe you can address to us later for more specific uh, conversations on this. Satish, you want to add something on this one? Uh, which one? The minimum size of funding? Uh, that, yeah, that's an the additional rate. question on the minimum size of funding. And the rate, but the rate. Uh, rates, okay, rates, again, it's it's a market rate. So we are yeah. not a subsidized lender. So we provide debt uh, to these partners at commercial rates. So that depends on various factors, the country risk rating, and then the institution, part institutions, uh, credit risk. So our lending to the institution. So we don't have a back-to-back -back arrangement. So we don't define the interest rate for the specific end, end project. And size of the funding, so uh, again, we, our lending is to the institution and then the, it can be very small. Like we also have some of the partner institutions who, who deploy or fund to average of $1,000 to some institution who deploy per project around 1 million. So we, have, we are quite diversified in that space. So there is no real uh, limit of funding size for those projects. So were um, a couple of other questions. One of them was about uh, any, if we prefer any specific refrigerants and how many cash projects are running. So refrigerants, we are we have a couple of conditions. The first one, we well, our preference is definitely natural refrigerants, and many of the providers we work with offer these technologies, so CO2 or ammonia, and this is our clear preference. However, in general, we understand that not all players um, and not all sectors and not all conditions allow necessarily for naturals, and we want in general to improve efficiency of systems and to transition to lower global warming potential refrigerants. So in that sense, we, we have the condition that it must have a zero ozone depleting potential, uh, be of lower toxicity, and it must comply with some <clears throat> specific ISO standards, uh, 5149, and the, generally, to make it simple, which has the lowest possible global warming potential. Um, there's one question on how many CAS projects are actually running. Um, so there is one project running in Colombia, which is uh, implemented by an investment fund called MGM Innova Group. They are, uh, we're, we will upload the case study very soon on our website. It is a, a highly efficient um, Daikin system, which is basically sold on a, on a per use basis to the client. And it's a, it's a mall. And it's a very interesting market because the tenants are basically paying for the cooling within their rent to the owner. So it's a way for the building owner not to invest in the system and for the tenants to access to higher efficiency um, cooling systems. Another project uh, or a couple are in, in Singapore and in, in India, uh, launched by a company called Kair, K-A-E-R. You can find them on, on our website as well. And hopefully this year we should have many more projects in all these countries that, that I've mentioned before. There's another question on whether we have uh, initial energy cooling assessments. So yes, uh, whenever um, a project, a CAS project is implemented, uh, the provider would basically do an assessment um, of the existing system. It works very well for retrofits, also for new buildings, but in the case of retrofits, you need to assess how much the building is currently consuming, how much maintenance they're paying, and you basically make an offer based on that, uh, which includes the, the savings. Um, there was another question before, uh, which I'm not sure we have answered, uh, whether we have partnered with uh, utilities, or whether we have considered this. Uh, I think with the on-bill financing mechanism, I've partly answered that question because there are some models that really require or are purely based really on 
such a partnership with utilities. But even in cooling as a service, there is a big potential for partnerships with utilities because, for instance, um, technology providers might uh, decide to to have uh, additional revenue streams from the utilities by adapting by doing some demand response management and reducing the load for the grid whenever they need, for example, by installing, as I said before, a thermal thermal um, energy storage, which would enable them to basically reduce the load in the system or increase the load in the system when, whenever it's appropriate for the, the utility. Thank you, Thomas. There is one uh, extra question on the um, impact of building management systems and the uh, some HVAC system failing because of malfunction of these management systems. Uh, Satish, I think you have some experience in that? Yeah, I think, uh, so this, this is a very common issue, not only for cooling, it's for any solution. So it's important to find a reliable uh, uh, technology, reliable partner. So, um, and uh, to back up any issues arising due, during this uh, implementation phase. So uh, this is a very generic uh, problem but again it has to be addressed with the initial uh, due diligence proper due diligence of identifying the right technology partners thank you Satish um, I think we have answered most of the questions please if you still have questions on the GCPF part uh, we can continue this discussion after the webinar if you can reach Satish or me and we put you in touch with the investment officer in your region for specific conditions of the fund and as Satish mentioned is, is depending on country and, and institution. Uh, thank you also for all your questions. As I mentioned at the beginning, on the, on the right side, you can still hand, uh, can access the presentation in PDF and you can access also the recording in the coming days. Anyway, we will share the, the link when available. Uh, thanks, Thomas, for your time. Thanks, Satish. And thanks for you to, uh, to you for listening to this webinar. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Thanks. We will answer the. There was a couple of more questions that we'll answer separately. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye.